Communion is a time to remember the life Jesus has given through, through us through his death and resurrection and is open to all who believe in him. Seeing that tomor tomorrow's Memorial Day, we're going to watch a clip from the movie Saving Private Ryan. Just curious, how many have seen this movie? Oh, good. Then you might get it. <laughs> Just a little background for about the movie for those who haven't seen it. Private Ryan's brothers are killed in a line of duty, and he is the only remaining son. Captain Miller and a group of soldiers are sent to find Private Ryan behind enemy lines and bring him home safely. It's a powerful movie about the sacrifices made by many for our freedom. Does anyone know what the two words that Captain Miller said to Private Ryan before he died? I know my wife does. <laughs> yes, earn it. This was an interesting ending to the movie as Ryan reflects on the sacrifices others made so he could live freely. Tomorrow we get to reflect on the sacrifice others made for us. But today we get to reflect on the on the life we have in Christ, nothing that we could earn but the sacrifice he made for us. I'd like to share John 3.17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the freedoms we have to commune together and the freedom from sin. Help us not to take this for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Did you know that there are these other people who come to church here that you don't see that often? Uh, so with, with Kevin retiring and us not having a lead pastor to take his place right away, um, we currently have a preaching team that's made up of Joe Druga, um, Ed Goff, um, Robert Blanchard, Eric Lowen, and myself. We're going to be taking turns um, preaching throughout this summer, and we've got planned out what we want to do for this summer. But as we look beyond into the fall, assuming that we don't have anybody hired by then, um, we're trying to think about what sermons, what sermon series we want to do later on. And we'd love to get feedback from you guys. Um, so if you've got ideas about future sermons, there is a sermon suggestion box. As you leave the auditorium today and turn to the right on your way out, on the table there, you can jot your ideas on a piece of paper. Um, I'd appreciate it if you put your name on there. That way, if I need to clarify anything, I know who to talk to. But you don't have to if you don't want to. I'd love to get feedback from you guys, um, specifically on two things. What would you like us to preach about? What topics or books of the Bible? Um, what would be helpful in your um, growth as a Christian? And secondly, how can we present these messages in ways that are helpful to you? Do you have any suggestions, ideas about how we deliver our messages? So that box will be back there um, today and next week. And if you're watching this online, um, if you could just email the church office, I think that would work just as well. Um, so we'd love to get your ideas. Can't promise that we'll follow every suggestion, but obviously if everybody's saying, hey, we really need to hear messages on this, well, we're going to pay attention to that. So thank you for your feedback. When I was in high school, um, I, there was this one TV show that I used to love to watch. Um, every, every weekday afternoon at 4 o'clock, I'd get home, try to finish my homework as soon as possible so I could watch Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, feel free to poke fun at me um, for that. So it's about the Starship Enterprise zooming through the universe and exploring things. And, um, there was this one character named Data. He's in the front there on the right, this pale-looking guy. So most of the main characters were, were humans, but Data was an android. So he looked and sounded human, but if you open this little panel in the back of his head, there's all these wires and stuff, because he's actually a really sophisticated robot. So in this one episode, he meets the man who invented him, this genius scientist who designed and built him. And Data's always full of questions, and he has questions for this guy. But the main thing he wants to ask him is, why did you create me? Why did you create me? What if you could meet your creator? What if you could actually talk to him? Is there anything you'd like to ask him? Anything you'd like to tell him? He knows everything about you. Is there anything you'd like to know about him? 
What if you could talk to him and hear from him? What if you could be in a close relationship with the one who made you? There are different ways to get to know God. One great way is to learn his names, because throughout the Bible, he's called by different names, different titles. And so this summer, what we want to do is do a sermon series called Knowing God by Name, where we'll look at one name for God each week, because each of these names is like a window into God's character. If you learn a name of God, you can call him by that name when you pray to him. And it kind of shows you how to interact with him based on who he is according to that name. So we're going to be looking at the Old Testament names for God, specifically from the Old Testament. A lot of times the Old Testament gets overlooked by Christians. We, we think it doesn't pertain to us, or it's really old and out of date, or it's really weird and hard to understand. Granted, it is a little difficult to understand at times, um, but at the same time, the Old Testament is a treasure house of knowledge about God. There is so much there about who he is and what he's like. So we want to explore these names of God this summer and get to know God a little better. Um, so we're going to begin today in the beginning. If you've got a Bible and you want to turn, um, there should be Bibles in, in the, under the chairs in front of you as well. If you want to open your Bible to the very first chapter of the Bible, that's where we're going to be this morning. And we'll also have the text on the screen. I'm going to be reading the, the words in white. Um, I'll ask that when we get to the words in yellow that we all read those out loud together. Before we do that, let's pray. God, you alone are God. There's no one else like you. I praise you that you have revealed yourself to us so we can get to know you better. And I praise you that you actually want to be in relationship with each one of us. Please help us get to know you better this summer. And today, I pray you help us get to know you as our creator. Amen. In the beginning, God created the sky and the earth. The earth was empty and had no form. Darkness covered the ocean, and God's spirit was moving over the water. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, so he divided the light from the darkness. God named the light day, and the darkness night. Evening passed, and morning came. This was the first day. Then God said, let there be something to divide the water in two. So God made the air and placed some of the water above the air and some below it. God named the air sky. Evening passed and morning came. This was the second day. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered together so the dry land would appear. And it happened. God named the dry land earth and the water that was gathered together seas. God saw that this was good. Then God said, let the earth produce plants some to make grain for seeds and others to make fruits with seeds in them. Every seed will produce more of its own kind of plant. And it happened. The earth produced plants with grain for seeds and trees that made fruits with seeds in them. Each seed grew its own kind of plant. God saw that all this was good. Evening passed and morning came. This was the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the sky to separate day from night. These lights will be used for signs, seasons, days, and years. They will be in the sky to give light to the earth. And it happened. So God made the two large lights. He made the brighter light to rule the day and made the smaller light to rule the night. He also made the stars. God put all these in the sky to shine on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that all these things were good. Evening passed and morning came. This was the fourth day. Then God said, let the water be filled with living things and let birds fly in the air above the earth. So God created the large sea animals and every living thing that moves in the sea. The sea is filled with these living things, with each one producing more of its own kind. He also made every bird that flies and each bird produced more of its own kind. God saw that this was good. God blessed them and said, have many young ones so that you may grow in number. Fill the water of the seas and let the birds grow in number on the earth. Evening passed and morning came. This was the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth be filled with animals, each producing more of its own kind. Let there be tame animals and small crawling animals and wild animals and let each produce more of its kind. And it happened. So God made the wild animals, the tame animals, and all the small crawling animals to produce more of their own kind. 
God saw that this was good. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image and likeness, and let them rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the tame animals, over all the earth, and over all the small crawling animals on the earth. So God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created them. He created them male and female. God blessed them and said, Have many children and grow in number. Fill the earth and be its master. Rule over the fish in the sea and over the birds in the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, Look, I have given you all the plants that have grain for seeds and all the trees whose fruits have seeds in them. They will be food for you. I have given all the green plants as food for every wild animal, every bird of the air, and every small crawling animal. And it happened. God looked at everything he had made, and it was very good. Evening passed, and morning came. This was the sixth day. So the sky, the earth, and all that filled them were finished. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it a holy day, because on that day he rested from all the work he had done in creating the world. The very first name for God that we encounter in the Bible is Elohim. Elohim is a Hebrew word. It gets translated as God or gods, like the gods of the other nations. It's a plural noun, which is interesting when you think about the Trinity. It's the name used for the creator of all things. So as you read through Genesis chapter 1, every time you see the word God, that's the word Elohim. In Genesis chapter 1, we learn two foundational truths about Elohim, our creator. First, he is good, very good. And everything that he has made is also good. It's interesting to note how many times the word good is used in chapter 1. And if you want to count, feel free. Um, how many times it's used in chapter 1? I'll tell you in just a moment. Um, as we read about our good God creating a good world, we find him doing three things. He forms, he fills, he finishes. Verse 2 said that the earth was formless and empty. And so... Elohim set about forming it and filling it. He forms it on days one, two, and three. And the way he does this is he separates one thing from another and he gives it a name. In doing this, he brings order. He separates light from darkness. The air separates the water and the clouds from the water on the earth. The waters are gathered together and seas. God brings order. This is what he does. Paul tells us that God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace. Chaos is not from God. Confusion is not from God. He brings order. And one of the ways he does this is by separating things and making distinctions. He does this not just in Genesis chapter 1, but throughout the Bible. He separates light from darkness, good from evil, right from wrong. Sometimes in our minds it gets confusing. The line kind of gets blurred. But God brings clarity. God brings truth. He brings order to the world and to our own lives. So he forms... But then he's got all these empty spaces, an empty sky, empty earth, um, empty seas. And so he fills them on days four, five, and six. He fills those. He fills all the emptiness, and he brings life. This is what Elohim does. He doesn't leave things empty. He fills them with good things. He fills our own lives with good things, and he brings life. He's the creator of life. He's the sustainer of life. So he forms, he fills he finishes. And we see this in the first few verses of chapter 2. He finishes his work of creating and brings wholeness. If you count how many times the word good is used in chapter 1, you'll find it's there seven times, which is interesting. Six days of creation, but seven times. And I think that's probably intentional. Because in the Bible, the number seven symbolizes perfection, completion, wholeness. God creates different things. He creates it. He says it's good. But only when everything is done does he stand back and say, it is very good, because it's complete. When God finishes his work of creation, nothing's missing. It's all there. It's complete and whole. So he finishes what he has begun. He doesn't start something and then forget about it or leave it undone. He brings it to completion. We can depend on him to do that. So he forms, he fills, he finishes. And in all these things, we see the goodness of Elohim and we see the goodness of what he's made. Now you may want to take issue with that. You may want to say, okay, 
there are good things in the world. I see the rainbows and the butterflies and the rabbits and all that. There's also poison ivy and stinging nettles and venomous snakes and ticks and mosquitoes and various animals that can kill you. Is, is creation really that good, you may be wondering. Hold that thought. I want to come back to that after we've looked at our second main point. Again, in Genesis chapter 1, we learn two foundational truths about our Creator. The second one is this. He creates with purpose. And what He creates also has purpose. You'll notice in Genesis chapter 1 and throughout the Bible, God never does something haphazardly. He never says, whoops. He never does anything on accident. When He, when he acts, He acts on purpose, which means this world is not here by chance. It's here by design. It's here on purpose. It's here because He wanted it here. You are part of this creation. And so the same is true of you. Even if you were an unplanned pregnancy, you were planned by God. We exist because God wants us here. He gave you life because he wanted you. He still wants you here. So he creates with purpose. Not only does he create with purpose, but what he makes has purpose. Everything God has created serves a purpose. To me, this is one of the most striking things about chapter 1. Everything has a purpose. The air separates the water above from the water below. The land and the seas provide habitats for living things. The plants provide food for the animals. The animals are, are given a purpose when God speaks to them on day five and day six. They're to fill the earth. Our purpose as human beings is revealed in verse 28. That's our purpose. I don't say it's our only purpose or even our main purpose. I think we read the rest of scripture to find that, that we are made to worship God and be in a close relationship with him now and forever. But as far as our relationship to the rest of the world goes, we are to rule over creation on God's behalf. We, we are God's managers. We're, we're the supervisors of nature, of earth. That's what we're to do on God's behalf. We've been made in his image. You think about what an image is. It's a representation of the real thing, right? You have an image on your phone. You've got a, a painting or a picture or a sculpture. It's a representation of something. We are made in the image of God. And a huge part of what that means is that we rule, just as God rules over all, we rule over creation. It's our responsibility to rule over it and to care for it. We are to reflect God's glory and goodness to the rest of creation, and especially to the animals. And you notice that in verse 28, all, all different kinds of animals are mentioned. I'm curious, how many of you, if you could just raise your hand, how many of you have livestock, cattle, pigs, sheep? Chickens, okay. Um, how many of you have horses? Okay, a few. Um, how many of you have one or more dogs as pets? How many of you do? All right, several. How about cat lovers? How many of you have cats? Okay, that's quite a number. Um, fish. <laughs> Joe, I've seen your office, yeah, okay. Um, what about birds, like living inside your house in a cage? Any pet birds? Okay, how about... Um, Small furry things. Okay, I'll put rabbits in this category, uh, hamsters, gerbils. My sister has a chinchilla, whatever that is. Um, any small furry thing. Okay, how about uh, one more question? I know never, not everybody's a fan. I think they're really cool myself. Anybody have reptiles as, as I'm getting a thumbs down? Okay, um, one more question. Um, how many of you have either a birdhouse or a bird feeder outside where you live? Good, good for you. All right, so human beings, as human beings, we live in close connection with animals, right? It's always been that way. It's supposed to be that way. We are to rule over them, to manage and supervise them, but also to care for them, and not just for them, but for the whole world. Um, we may disagree about how best to protect the environment or how best to manage wildlife and other natural resources, but I hope we can all agree that it is our God-given responsibility to care for planet Earth, to care for what this creation that God has made. He's put us in charge. We're to represent him to the rest of the world. In giving us a purpose, God has done a few things. He's given us his blessing and also his command. You'll see this in verse 22 and again in verse 28 where it says, God blessed them and said, and then it gives us command. I don't think those two are separate. I think they go together. You might even say that 
The command is how we live out the blessing of God. We are blessed to do what God has told us to do. And as we survey the rest of Scripture, I think we can confidently say that you cannot fully experience the goodness of God. You cannot fully experience the blessings of God apart from his commands. You live in obedience to his commands and you experience the fullness of his blessing. Secondly, in giving us uh, our purpose, God has given us autonomy, but he's also placed us under his authority. In other words, we have freedom to be our own people, to do our own thing, but we're intended to live under his authority. He's the one issuing commands here, not us. So the intent is that we use our autonomy as human beings to serve God's purposes, to remain under his authority. But you don't have to read very far in the Bible before you find the opposite of that happening. When you get to Genesis chapter 3, just two chapters later, we read about our ancestors, Adam and Eve, who used their autonomy to reject God's authority and go against what he said. As a result, they come under God's curse, but it's not just them. Look at Genesis 3, 17 and 18. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground, the ground, because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. If I read this correctly, there weren't thorns and thistles before human beings sinned against their creator. Creation has been distorted. It's come under God's curse. And I assume that if that's true of thorns and thistles, it will be true of all manner of dangerous and harmful plants and animals. Something is not right with creation. Creation is offline, so to speak. And we can't just blame Adam and Eve for that. Because all of their descendants, including you and me, have continued to sin against our creator. Genesis chapter 6, verse 11 says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God made this world to be full of life. We filled it with violence. He made it to be full of goodness and his glory. We filled it with shame and all kinds of wickedness. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. I can't help but think of recent news. This world is full of brokenness. It's full of evil. And we have to own up to the fact that each one of us has contributed to that fallenness in some way by sinning against our Creator. But because Elohim is so good and because He is so powerful, He devised a plan, a great initiative to restore creation. He's not going to leave it like this. He's going to get it back to what it was supposed to be from the very beginning. And he's chosen to do this in two phases. Phase one of creation restored was put into effect when Christ came to earth. Phase two will be completed when Christ returns to earth. Now when you've got a problem, you go to the root of the problem, right? What is causing the dripping under your bathroom sink? Where is it coming from? You got a rowdy group of students at school. Who's the troublemaker? You're a healthcare professional. What's causing the illness? Not just the symptoms. We want to get to the root cause. God also gets to the root cause of creation. It's not the thorns and thistles fault. It's not the animals or the earth. It's us. We are the problem. It's our sin that has ruined not only our relationship with God, but the rest of creation. And so Elohim sets about to reform and transform human beings in a totally remarkable way by becoming a human being himself. Jesus is God in the flesh. You look at Jesus and you see what Elohim is like. You see his glory when you look at Jesus Christ. And not only is he our example of what the perfect image of God is supposed to look like, because he perfectly reflects God, but he's also our redeemer. He came to deal with the sin that ruined our relationship with God, and he did that. This is why we have crosses everywhere as Christians. He did that by offering his life on the cross, because he loved you enough to pay the price for your sin in the hope that one day you would put your trust in him, repent of your sins, and be made right with God. Be restored to your creator. That is where creation 
begins to be restored. And so what's cool is, as you read through the New Testament, you'll often find the New Testament writers of these books using creation language to talk about what God is doing through Jesus Christ. In other words, they'll use words and phrases from Genesis chapter 1. An example of this is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. We see God's glory when we look at Christ. Our hearts were full of darkness because of sin, and God said, let there be light. And the light of his glory, as we see it in Christ, in his death and resurrection, the light of God's glory shined into our hearts, dispelled the darkness. And as a result, according to the next chapter, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is a Christian, a true follower of Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. You are part of that new creation. This is where creation begins to be restored. When individuals encounter Jesus Christ and place their trust in him. But that's not the end of it, of course, because even when we've been justified with God, we've still got all of those old sinful habits of thinking and, and acting to, to, that need to be changed. And so God continues this work of renewal, the work of restoring creation, by working in our lives through his Holy Spirit. We read about this in the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Paul says, do not lie to each other. And it's not just lying. He's mentioned several verses, several sins in the previous verses. Do not lie. Do not sin. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which it's being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. There again, he's using that creation language. So as we get to know God, we're being renewed we're being renewed in the image of our creator so that we can better reflect him to the rest of creation and to other human beings in particular because that's what God's focused on right now. This impacts not just us, but potentially the rest of the world. Paul writes at the beginning of this letter, he's talking about the impact that the gospel has had on the Colossians, and he says, in the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it, and truly understood God's grace. He goes on to say in verse 9, So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will, or to fill you with the knowledge of his will, and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn God, to know God better and better. The better you know God, the better you can reflect God. And when we're doing that, we're a part of the solution instead of the problem. See, through sin, we were a part of the problem. We were contributing to the fallenness of this world. But through Christ, now we're part of the solution. Okay, so that's phase one. But there's a lot left undone even then. Because our bodies still get old and die. And creation is still completely messed up and subject to decay and death. God will deal with all of that when Christ returns. And Paul writes about this in the book of Romans. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. God has promised that for those who have put their trust in Christ, we'll be given a new body, a body that cannot get old and die, a body that will last forever with him. But it's not just us that will be renewed. It's the rest of creation. The plants and animals, everything will be freed from decay and death. Can you imagine a world where nothing dies? That's what we're moving toward. That's what God has promised to bring about when he fully restores creation. And the last scripture we'll look at this morning, these verses come from the book of Revelation. John also writes about this creation being restored. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. It's a vision of creation fully restored. He goes on to say in the last chapter of the Bible, no longer will there be any curse. 
There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. You were made to reign. To rule over creation with Christ. That's still the plan. And even now, God is carrying out that plan person by person as the gospel reveals the truth about who God is and about what he's done for us through Jesus. Which means that as Christians, we are on the leading edge of God's great initiative to restore creation. We're right there in the middle of it, right on the leading edge of how God is restoring creation. As we share the gospel with others, as we get to know God better and reflect him better to the world, this great mission that he has of restoring creation advances person by person. It's all made possible through the spirit of our creator. He was there at the beginning, hovering over the waters. He's here now, living in each of us who belong to Christ. He's forming us after the image of our creator. He's filling us and empowering us to fill the whole earth with God's light and truth. And rest assured, he will finish what he's begun, because that is what Elohim does. That's what our great God does. He forms, he fills, and he finishes. Just a reminder, um, we'd love to get your feedback for future sermons at Sermon Suggestion Boxes out there in the foyer. Also, I just wanted to say, I know that many of you are in the habit of spending time with God each day. You have a daily quiet time where you read the scriptures and you pray to God. If you're not in the habit of doing that and you need a little help getting started, um, just some suggestions here. On the sermon page in the bulletin, towards the bottom there, there's several passages of scripture listed. They all have to do with God as creator. If you want to use these, you can read them throughout the week and there's a few questions for you to consider to kind of guide you in, in, your, in your prayers with, to God. Every one of us has been given an incredible opportunity to actually know the person who created us. Um, I'm here today just to encourage you to do that, to get to know him better. Let's pray. God, you are awesome. So far beyond us, beyond our imagination, but you, you've reached out to us and you've revealed yourself to us and especially you've sent us your son. I praise you. God, help us to know you as our maker. Help us to know you personally, to know the love that you have for us, to know the purposes that you have for our lives. Thank you for your goodness, always good. Thank you for making us and for giving us your son and your spirit and your word. Amen.